jump right in. Charlie, you want to ask the first couple of questions? Sure. All right, so first question. Recently, there have been a number of brands moving away from platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Do you think these platforms are, in their current formats, reaching the end of their shelf life? And if so, what do you think they need to do to continue on? Or what do you think the future of social communication looks like? Yeah, so, oh boy, I can hear myself. That's weird. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a really insightful question. Um, I think that in their current states, um, Facebook and Twitter definitely have some changing to do. Um, I think especially with the recent news about um, Facebook's role in the 2016 United States presidential election, um, what they've been doing with everyone's user data. I think people... Um, are a little bit leery about what Facebook knows about you and what they can do with that. Um, and I think Twitter has got some answering to do for um, sort of how they've let how they've let certain um, factions of society grow and fester on their platform. So I don't know that while I don't know that they're necessarily like going to, I don't think that Facebook and Twitter are going to be over tomorrow, but I do think that um, as, a, as a society, people are starting to be cognizant of sort of how these digital platforms can affect us um, in a really major way moving forward. So I think they're, they're sort of realizing that too. Like, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg had any idea going into building Facebook that in a couple of years, he would be majorly responsible for impacting a country's presidential election. So I think, um, I think right now we're sort of at a turning point where people are really considering um, how, how these platforms that they're giving all their data to are impacting their everyday lives. So I think, yeah, people are going to start, um, both businesses and individuals are going to start sort of choosing more carefully where they invest their time and resources. Thank you. And second question, what is your biggest recommendation for someone interested in a career in social media? I'm so sorry, could you say that again? I didn't hear the second half. Sure. Um, what's your biggest recommendation for someone interested in a career in social media? Oh, yeah. Um, so I would say definitely know a little bit about a lot of things um, because social media is absolutely something that you can take in a lot of different directions. Um, so it's good to be a generalist, but I think there there's... You can take social media, um, you can be a social media creative, you could take it in a more strategic direction. Um, you could really f decide to focus on the intersection of social media and customer care. So I think it pays to sort of get a little bit of experience in a lot of different areas to kind of figure out where, where in the social media landscape you think your skills work best and kind of... Um, figure out what works for you, what speaks to you. Because I think um, as as social media continues, develop, continues to develop as a practice and as a skill set, um, there's going to be a lot more room to specialize and diversify. So I think just continuing to um, continuing to hone your skills and know a little bit about a lot, about a lot of things um, really will help you in the long run. Brilliant, thank you. Hello. Um, hi. Hi. Um, did the working environment change with the growing number of fans that were interacting daily with the content after the um, Nugs for Carter campaign? So after the Nugs for Carter campaign, um, did the working environment change and did you find it stressful? So I, um, I should specify that I left Wendy's before Nugs for Carter. Um, so I have not been at Wendy's for about a year. I left last March. Um, so the last thing I was there for was sort of the, um, the roast where we made fun of a guy so hard he deactivated his Twitter account, oh. but I can speak to that. Um, and it definitely, it did change, um, quite, quite drastically, um, as Wendy's got more and more attention. Um, we sort of, um, as it as it grew, it just um, there was a lot more. Um, it sort of shifted from a traditional working schedule to kind of um, everyone being always on, um, having to check in a lot more, having to um, divide who is working at nights on the weekends. So and there was a lot more scrutiny on what we're doing, and there continues to be today. Um, it was sort of for a long time at Wendy's. It was kind of like 
Um, you could, not a whole lot of people, it was sort of like social media, the team was kind of um, sort of flying under the radar and um, it kind of turned into what everyone in the world was paying attention to. And it was sort of this feeling like literally anything you tweeted had the potential to go viral, which isn't the reality of the situation, but it kind of felt like that. So it was really nerve wracking. Um, just the idea that like millions of people were watching anything you put on the internet. So I think it definitely, the stakes felt much higher, even if they weren't really, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one more question. Um, what were some of the social media marketing metrics that you and consequently Wendy's were most concerned with? Yeah, so I think for a brand like Wendy's, um, it's obviously a lot less about general awareness because a lot of people know what Wendy's is already, um, which is kind of both a blessing and a curse um, because we can't really just measure like engagement um, because that's a little too um, it's a little too basic for us because um, sort of just engagement or reach it's kind of like okay well people know about Wendy's now but they kind of already did um, so we were really looking for like um, for us social media was really about brand building and about um, changing people's perception of Wendy's as a brand so how to really differentiate Wendy's from the competitive set how to make people think Wendy's is cool so we looked a lot at um, sentiment around our tweets, which is a really manual process, but a lot of um, really looking at, and not just tweets, but Instagram and Facebook and everything, really looking at consumer conversation and what people are saying about Wendy's. Um, we did a lot of work to tie our social metrics back to um, what the Wendy's um, research team did around brand health. So measuring our social media activity in in tandem with brand health metrics, like do people think Wendy's is a brand for them? Do people think Wendy's has healthy and fresh food? Um, and trying to tie those together. And then for things like um, Nux for Carter, I would assume I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't there for that, but for things that got really big, we would measure it in terms of um, PR value. So we'd have our PR team work out how, um, how much, how much brand awareness, not, not awareness, how much um, publicity did we generate for Wendy's and for free? And what is the monetary value of this publicity that we generated? Like if we attempted to purchase this amount of coverage, how much would that have cost? So um, we often sort of tried to derive a dollar value out of our earned media coverage, which um, went a long way when we were trying to speak to executives about the power of social media, like, look, this sort of organic back and forth got us all over the news, which is something you can't even really mm -hmm. buy. So those were some of the metrics we looked at. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, Amy, my name's Spencer Poprowski. It's nice to finally speak to you. Hi. Uh, um, I'm just wondering, how did your time with Wendy's help you develop as a social media professional? Oh my gosh, it was, um, so I started at Wendy's when I was 23 and I was there for almost five years and it was honestly, I would say I developed most of my skills there. Um, I came in with very little um, social media management background. I'd had like an internship in social media before, but my background was really in um, journalism and copywriting. And I just had like, I, I mostly did social media as like a hobby. Like I've always been very personally interested in social media, but I really just, I had like kind of a distinct point of view. I was like, you, you guys need some help. I feel like I can do this. Let's go. Um, and so I, I, um, I didn't really know much more than that. And so I, that's sort of where I started. And I, I got all of this experience and strategy and creative, and I got to meet like really smart people. I got to see how like a, a call center is run and helped build one. And so just, I got hands-on crisis management experience for better or worse. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it really was, uh, it's just, it's the kind of experience you really can't get anywhere else. So it's been, it was honestly the biggest, the, I, I don't know where, w without it, I definitely would not be where I am. So yeah, it was, it was huge. All right, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi there. 
before Wendy's began using a more sassy tone, the overall brand message was that of uh, family tradition and feeling like you're at home when you eat there through the use of the figurehead Dave. So I'm wondering what the, what the leap was to becoming the most sassiest social media out there. Yeah, so first, I love that question. Very insightful. Um, so I think internally, Wendy's has always, um, so the brand positioning internally has always been sort of, Wendy's sees themselves as a challenger brand. So like McDonald's and Burger King are much bigger. McDonald's specifically has just so many more restaurant locations. Um, both in the U.S., which is obviously, was, which was the main focus for me, but also worldwide. They're just so much more of a presence. So, But Wendy's, um, they specifically like to refer to themselves as a challenger with charm. Um, if you look back to some of the old television advertisements with Dave Thomas in them, they're actually like pretty funny. Um, they sort of have like a little wink and a nod. Like Wendy's has always been kind of a little bit goofy. Um, so we really drew a lot of inspiration from that when we were... Um, when we were building out our social media plans, we sort of wanted to take what Wendy's has always been and contemporize it a little. Um, obviously, Dave Thomas isn't around anymore, but we still really wanted to honor his legacy. There are a lot of people in the Wendy's building who knew him and worked with him. So um, it's definitely a very delicate thing to do, um, contemporize a brand, but still pay homage to its legacy. But we definitely, um, we felt that that was something we were doing, is um, how, do we, how do we bring this into the present day. And it was sort of this, well, we're a challenger, but we're going to um, not necessarily like go directly after the big guys, but sort of like, you know, we're, we're a little bit better than, than the big guys and we'll let them know it. So I think that's really sort of where we were coming from in the beginning. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, my first question, uh, what was your first win that made you confident that you're doing the right thing? Oh, yeah. So I guess I don't know if there's any one big win I could point to before, like, obviously the really big wins that sort of ended up on TV and stuff. I guess it was really just sort of a series of small wins, um, which I think is probably the norm. Um, but it was really just starting because... I get so I started at Wendy's in 2012, and for years there really weren't like quote unquote big wins. There were just lots and lots of little ones. So it was like we we started out with like a hundred thousand followers on Twitter when I first got the job. So um, it was like we'd post something and people would be like, "Oh, that's really funny," or "Oh, this tweet makes me want to go get a cheeseburger." And it was sort of taking those little wins and building on top of it. Um, so it really wasn't for, I would say there are very few big wins, honestly, that I could point to. And it was more taking those daily little things, people saying, oh my God, this is hilarious. I love this. And just le letting those, using using my own, cre using the team's creative sense and sort of um, community feedback to keep building slowly in the right direction, if that makes sense. Un until we finally got a big win, which took kind of a while. <laughs> yeah, awesome, thank you. And the second question is, what is the best career advice you've received that has helped you with your success? Oh yeah, I love this question. Um, so my, the guy who hired me at Wendy's, his name is Brandon. He, um, he works at Papa John's now. Um, he's a very good dude. And he once told me that it's important to bring your whole weird eccentric self to your job. Um, and if it feels like you need to somehow be less or smaller, you're probably not in the right place. Um, so I'm sort of there. And I think this specifically applies to sort of my generation, a lot of young people, um, I'm still in my 20s, and sort of coming into a corporate environment for a lot of us, I think can be kind of kind of daunting. It feels like they maybe don't want you to be as much of yourself as you want to be. But I think sort of bringing, bringing your whole perspective and all of your experience is, is really important and really valuable. Um, and I think if you find yourself in a place where they ever want you to not be that, you're probably in the wrong room. 
Um, and then I guess the other really great piece of advice I've gotten is as you rise, bring people with you. Um, so sort of as you, as you move forward in your career, make sure to bring the people who've helped you along with you. Um, it just, cause sort of the good put out in the world will come back to you. So just make sure to remember that the people who helped you get where you are, bring them along with you when good things happen to you. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Amy. It's great that Skype's finally working. Um, I only got one question for you. Um, how long does it take you to come up with creative content, and what's the most viral post on Twitter you've ever created? Yeah, so I guess it really depends on kind of the creative process. So at Wendy's, um, I was not actually mainly responsible for coming up with creative content. We worked with an external agency. They're called VML. They're based out of Kansas City. Um, they are fantastic. Um, in my current job, I, I am primarily responsible for coming up with creative concepts for social media. And that really depends. Um, it depends on kind of a lot of things. Um, is the content text only? Um, because I guess personally, I don't really have graphic design skills. So then we have um, internal creatives who I can work with on graphic stuff. Um, and then also, I guess, is does the idea come, has it come fully formed or is it sort of like this kind of idea would be funny, but I have to like massage the joke until it sort of gets there. Cause sometimes like maybe a line will pop into my head and it's there, but other times it's like, I have sort of a hazy idea of what it could be, but then I've got to like write it down and come back to it in a week. So I guess it sort of really depends, um, which I know is like the worst answer, but <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it just, it really it's, it's the creative process. It's hard and gross. So like sometimes I'll have a really great idea that never comes to fruition. And sometimes a really great idea will come to me in the shower, just like right. it'll pop into my head and that's the tweet. So, um, that's just sort of how it works. Um, and as for the most viral tweet, I think it was probably the one where I got in the back and forth with the guy who was like, you know, you freeze all the beef. And I was like, no, refrigerators exist. And then it ended up on like the Anderson Cooper show. And, um, that was, that was really surreal. Um, awesome. but yeah, I think that was probably it. Awesome. And the creative process for that was none. That was spur of the moment. So sometimes that just happens. Um, very cool. Thank you. Hi, Amy. Two questions for you. Um, the first one, obviously once Wendy started to gain traction in the Twitterverse, uh, you guys got flooded with tweets and replies. I was just wondering what factors uh, you took into consideration when deciding which ones to reply to and which ones to ignore. Yeah. So. Definitely as Wendy started to get attention, we actually measured it the, um, the day after that the tweet heard around the world went on Anderson Cooper. We got more replies and mentions in a day than we had in the previous month. So it was definitely sort of an incoming flood. Um, we did, we sort of, we had like an emergency meeting. We're like, oh my God, what do we do? <laughs> this, is, this is maybe too much. Um, we sort of, we prioritized, um, so we prioritized obviously incoming things that we could really play off of, have fun with. Um, obviously we try not to feed the trolls as much as possible in any situation. Um, just cause typically that never ends up good. Um, we, we had to do a lot of adjusting. The, the previous strategy was reply to as many people as possible, which turned out to just be not, not, not a good strategy moving into sort of the next phase of how Wendy's was working. So it was really, um, it honestly turned into just as many as we could catch that we had good answers for. Um, I, I wish I had insight for you as to how they're doing it now. Cause I think that volume has sustained, but I, I do not. So, okay. Thank you. They're, they're just really smart and really fast. So. Awesome. Um, and my second question is if you could choose any food or beverage company in the entire world to manage their social media, which one would you choose? Oh man. Um, 
I think Starbucks is amazing. Um, they've always done such good work. Um, I feel like working at Taco Bell would be a lot of fun. Um, (laughs) they always seem to be having a lot of fun. And also I really love Taco Bell, um, which I know is like, I'm, I feel like I'm too old to eat at Taco Bell. Uh, but, um, so maybe them, um, I don't know. I think those would be my top two, even though I feel a little embarrassed that I've picked two other fast food restaurants. (laughs) No, that's awesome. Thank you. Hi, Amy. It's Scott again. Um, Just got a list of questions that were submitted by students. So they're going to span your current career, advice, tools, and Wendy's, if that's okay. Um, One of the questions was, at Wendy's, you're able to piggyback off traditional advertising, such as television and print. In your opinion, how important and how useful was it to leverage this exposure and name recognition? Mainly, you weren't starting from uh, scratch with a brand with very little recognition. You were working with a brand that people already recognized, already had an idea of. So how much help do you think it was for television and print? to further your message? I think it helped a lot. Like I said, it helped a lot in that we didn't really have to explain what Wendy's was. Like you go out and you're like, hey, Wendy's has a new cheeseburger and people know what Wendy's is. So you don't really, there's a step you get to skip in that you don't have to say, hi, we're Wendy's and we do X. Um, People know what you're talking about. But I will say that there was a little bit of work to do the the attitude toward Wendy's has changed pretty drastically in the last couple of years. And when I started in 2012, the internet was not always, I mean, the internet is never nice, but the internet was really not super nice. Um, people definitely have strong opinions about fast food companies. Um, some of them, some of them for valid reasons, like there are valid critiques of fast food restaurants and the whole system. Um, but some of them are just real mean they're like uh cheeseburgers make you fat so um there's (laughs) there's um so being able to build upon an existing brand is helpful but there's also um there are a lot of preconceived notions and opinions that you kind of have to work around which can be difficult um especially with a brand that's been around since the late 60s um it's definitely it can be hard to work with people's preconceived notions of a brand that is so old yeah. It was just a different platform, and the voice coming from it differs from what you would expect out of Wendy's. We're just curious. Um, next question. One of the most common knocks on social media is the ability to show ROI. So for a business, showing a return on their investment. Is this something that you've encountered? And if so, how do you prove an ROI? Or how do you explain what you're doing is generating sales for Wendy's? Is there, how would you, have you encountered that in business meetings? How did you combat that? Or what did uh, you use as an explanation? Yeah, so I guess the biggest struggle at Wendy's, um, I guess we really, we really stopped having that conversation when we finally made it clear that social media was not a direct sales channel for us. Like that is not, that's not what we're trying to do here. Like if you're tr- like, we cannot prove through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever that we've sold more stuff. Like we're just never going to be able to do that. So like that is, that's not our goal here. That's not never like our, we were using our goal on social media is a branding channel is for brand perception is for making people it, brand consideration. But I think at the end of the very early on, we realized because Wendy's doesn't have e-commerce, um, there's no real way to tie engagements on our Facebook or our Twitter back to someone actually going to the drive through and buying a cheeseburger that we needed to focus on something else. We needed to focus on making, making the brand Wendy's itself more desirable to consumers before we could focus on selling them a cheeseburger. So sort of, we took one step back and we're like, maybe we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves and maybe we're putting the cart before the horse and maybe we're trying to do something we can't measure anyway. So for us, we really, we really tried to focus more on the, those things we can measure, like turning detractors into fans, um, turning, turning the, turning the, um, 
proportion of the conversation that's negative, making it more positive over time, things like that. So um, I think that's really, that was the ROI we were really, um, we were really focused on because that's really what we can affect through social. And um, as for sales, like we can draw a correlation between what we're doing in social and how many cheeseburgers were sold, but we're never going to be able to draw an exact number until Wendy's can sell cheeseburgers online, which um, they don't yet. So, um, as your Wendy's fame grew, did you notice a large intake or uptick of customers trying to bait you? So was it sort of a flood in your stream that there were, um, I guess, a segment of trolls trying to bait you into these refrigerator type conversations? And if so, how did you segment these out? Like what tools did you use to, I guess, decipher between those that are trying to get burnt by you or try to get some of that Twitter fame by arguing with Wendy's and the, I guess, legitimate customers that had questions? So did you use specific tools to uh, filter these? How how did that work at Wendy's? I'm so sorry. I didn't hear part of that. Okay, so um, as after the CNN and people started to recognize Wendy's as one of the companies that will engage with consumers with that sassy and sarcastic brand, did you see a large uptick of people trying to uh, bait you, engage with you, or trying to basically start a Twitter fight with you so they can get on CNN? And if so, what tools did you use, I guess, to sort out the, the trolls trying to fight you, uh, trying to gain fame, the customers actually asking you legitimate questions? What tools did you use to sort them out and how did you decide who you were going to respond to? Did it switch from uh, trying to answer legitimate questions or trying to get uh, more reach, I guess? Yeah, so we... Um so Wendy's is split between the marketing team and the customer care team. So all legitimate, all legitimate issues did still get um, on the back end. We do use a social monitoring tool. So all legitimate issues like, hey, I went to a restaurant and my fries were cold or I got the wrong sandwich. Um, those still went to the customer care team. Um, so there was definitely, even though... Um, even though we had like an influx of people trying to bait us into fights, we still managed to get in there and really to our priority on social was, um, was at the end of the day, making sure people who had problems and needed to speak to a customer service representative that they were addressed first, because that was about half of our volume. So we would always get to those people first because they actually need to talk to someone. Um, and then sort of from there, prioritize um, legitimate questions like, hey, do you have this on your menu? When is this coming back? Um, and from there, move sort of our standard stuff we had um we sort of prioritized by like we really want to engage with people who are just saying nice things like hey i love wendy's um this the double stack's my favorite sandwich um so we would try to pick those out and then um we kind of we had aligned in an internal meeting like hey if we're gonna roast like let's roast directed at our competitors like maybe not directed at this guy in his hat like it's funny but it's mean so like, um, and so we sort of, we tried to pick and choose those, like which of these, which of these tweets baiting us into a fight can we make into like McDonald's or Burger King is gross, not you, the consumer are bad. So that's sort of, that was sort of our measurement for that. Were you nervous going after McDonald's and Burger King? They're two big companies, right? So it's not like going after a small chain or a small restaurant. Did you have any trepidation going after big brands like that? Did your boss or anyone else on the team caution you or was it something that you guys just went for? Oh no, it was definitely um, something we proceeded with caution. <laughs> um, and definitely there were, we had many, um, we had a lot of meetings about it even before the, um, before the first like roast incident happened. We actually, um, and even like you'll see today that um, senior leadership at Wendy's um, is very excited about proactively going after McDonald's and Burger King. That's kind of like that's sort of their thing right now. Um, and we act there were um, 
that's something that was talked about internally for like two or three years. Um, and everyone was very hesitant to do it because everyone was sort of like, how are they going to respond? Like, is this mean spirited? Should we like, should we wait for someone to do this first and we retaliate because it's like, maybe it's more in our brand character to not like throw the first punch. Um, so it is something definitely that we, um, that everyone talked about, um, at length for a really long time. So what was your measurement for that to determine if it was a success? So obviously you're going after somebody, you talked about it, throwing that first punch. How would you deem that to be a success? So I think one of the, um, so for the first sort of roasting, the roasting incident, the first one where we were, um, where we roasted the guy back and forth, the one that ended up on Anderson Cooper on CNN. Um, so one of the main goals for our chief marketing officer going into 2017 was that he wanted to increase awareness that Wendy's used fresh, never frozen beef. So part of what we measured was how many times people, people repeated that phrase, like how many times that phrase was put in news articles, put out, um, put like, how many times they said it on CNN, how many times it got repeated ad nauseum in news stories. And sort of, we measured the the value of that. Like we could have purchased a bunch of advertising that said Wendy's has fresh, never frozen beef, but these guys did the work for us. So what's the monetary value of that? And that's really how we measured that. Like we had a campaign going on at the same time about fresh, never frozen beef, but this wildly successful organic tweet honestly got us a ton, like it was millions of dollars worth of advertising value. Um, so that was part of how we, how we measured the success of that one. What was it like when you found out it was on Anderson Cooper? Like we watched that reenactment, uh, and that took a couple minutes on primetime and CNN. That was a big deal. What was that like for you? And how did you find out about it? What was that moment like? Um, honestly, <laughs> honest, my first reaction when something kind of goes the way I did not expect it to, because I, I didn't expect that. Um, my first reaction was, oh my God, I'm fired. I just, cause we like, we didn't talk about that happening. I just like sent out a tweet and the next thing I know it's on CNN. And I was like, I guess I'm fired. Like, I don't, <laughs> I didn't even cross my mind that this was a good thing. I was just like, I didn't talk to my boss about this. Like nobody knew this was coming. Like I'm dead. Um, so obviously that didn't happen, but, um, no, it, um, it took a minute for me to let, for it to sink in that this was like very cool and good. Cause I'm like, I'm very anxious and neurotic. So I was just like, Oh my God, this is so bad. Like, what did I do? I broke everything. Um, but <laughs> No, it was really cool. Um, people I hadn't spoken to in forever were like, did you make this tweet? Um, so no, it was, it, it's, it was surreal and bizarre. Um, I feel like my life has only recently returned to normal. So yeah, it's, I, I will, I'm still trying to figure out how to adequately, ex adequately explain that like a dumb thing I wrote from my couch was reenacted by Anderson Cooper. Like yeah. even a year later, it is astounding to me. It's, so, <laughs> it was, and they made such a big deal about it. It was massive, which is one of the reasons why we contacted you. It was such a big event. Um, I'm going to switch gears a tiny bit here. Um, we've got a couple questions from students about future careers and things to look for, if that's okay. Um, if I get something incorrect, most of it was from some of the research in LinkedIn, but it appears that you won a few awards at cons. Could you say that again? Uh, it looks like you won a few awards at the cons advertising competition. Yeah. Which is huge. Um, with our program here, we've had a, actually a couple students and or selected to enter the competition actually place. Um, we're proud obviously, but from a winner's perspective, what has that done for your career? of having that on your resume, because it's a global competition, right? So how do you feel that's helped you in your career? Um, I feel like it might be too soon to tell. Um, so that really, I, and I guess I sort of have a weird perspective because I, I was, I had already left Wendy's when Wendy's won these awards. So it's very cool, but I was a little bit removed from the process. Um, so it's, but um, yeah, it's really cool that the work was recognized. Um, it also is like, I don't know, I've worked on so many other things that I wish would have gotten recognized, but it's kind of funny that um, 
I don't know. It's, it's weird that it was this when I think about like all of the things I've worked so hard on. And then it's, I really did like, I did not work very hard on this tweet that got so much attention, which is sort of the weird irony of the whole thing. Um, so sometimes when I think about how hard I worked on stuff that like nobody really saw, that's never going to win any awards. It makes me like wistful in a weird way. (laughs) But, um, no, it's so cool. Um, I, I um, I don't know if it. I, I, I do. I do have a job now. I was freelancing for about a year. Um, I started a new position about a month ago. I feel like the awards probably helped. Um, so yeah, it's definitely it's something I don't take for granted. I'm very excited. Um, I hope to someday. I hope to someday win an award for something that is not the Wendy's tweet. I would like to do something else eventually. So I guess that's my answer to that is I'm excited about it. And also I'm ready to do the next thing. So, um, in your LinkedIn profile, it said you were an intern to start your career. Is that correct? Yeah. So in our program, our third year students are going out on their four week internship in about a couple of weeks. How valuable was your internship for you? Yeah, so while I was in college, I did two internships, and then after I graduated, um, right after college, I had a paid internship before I got a job, just because um, I couldn't really find a job I was interested in, so I actually got a social media internship paid for a couple of months, um, and my I loved my internship experiences. Um, the two I did in college were actually very eye-opening in that one of them taught me a lot about what I didn't want to do, which um, in itself is really valuable. Um, but no, I definitely, I learned a lot about, um, my social media internship obviously showed me that there was a career path to do this in the first place, which was super cool. Um, I made a lot of connections at my internships. Of, they're people I still keep in touch with now. Um, I don't know. I would say though that I, all of my work experience up to this point has been valuable. Um, I worked retail in high school in a customer service position, and you would be amazed how those skills transfer to a social media job. Um, I think everyone should be forced to work customer service at some point in their life. I think it makes you a better person. Um, so I, I definitely, I think, I think there's something to gain from every job, even if it doesn't seem like it is going to benefit what you eventually want to do in your professional life. Um, but yes, I love my internships is the short answer to that. Um, are there any social media trends that our graduates here should pay close attention to? Because some of them are going on an internship, social media internships, um, some plan to work in the social media industry. Are there any trends that you see as you're in it day to day that they should pay careful attention to? I'm, I'm really fascinated by kind of for a long time, everything on social media trended towards more public, more open, everyone share everything. And now it's sort of trending back to more closed network. Um, Facebook groups are such a, um, I feel like if Facebook, if Facebook survives this whole data thing, which I'm sure they will because they're Facebook. Um, but I think sort of the next iteration of Facebook is really going to be um, a lot more private, a lot more focused on your own circle, and a lot more focused on um, groups. I think sort of this trend of what I loved about the early internet pre-social media is sort of meeting and interacting with people um, with who are like-minded and have these same niche interests. So sort of um, people forming people forming little tight-knit user communities. Um, and also sort of, I think, I think social is trending back towards the ephemeral, towards, um, towards content that doesn't live forever. Um, so like Instagram stories, like Snapchat, um, I think people are sort of starting to see the effects of like, maybe they don't want something they posted in college to follow them around the internet forever. Um, I'm starting to feel that way. Um, when Facebook pops up and is like, look what you posted six years ago. I'm like, please no. Um, so I think there are some, I think those are some interesting trends I've noticed. Um, and I think people are actually are starting to get a little more cognizant of who has their data and what they're doing with it. Um, so I think companies are going to have to start answering a lot more very direct pointed questions about that. And that leads into how do you keep up with these trends? 
So obviously the social, digital advertising, it seems to reinvent itself every six months. How do you keep up with what you do? So I admit I do not manage to keep up with all of them. And that's why I definitely, I always surround myself with people who are smarter than me. Um, like I'm, I, I used to, I used to be everywhere on everything and it's just, it's not sustainable, like even from a personal perspective. Um, but I definitely think having a personal interest in this stuff helps. Um, you don't necessarily need to be like Twitter famous or an Instagram influencer, but definitely like knowing the ins and outs of the platforms, um, staying up on all of their updates, uh, and just be, being a good student of what they're doing. There's, there's no substitute for practical experience. Uh, and then developing your own point of view. So not just keeping up with what people are doing, what new things brands and people are doing, but developing your own opinion on if you like it or not. So not just like, not just reading about what other people's opinions are, but like, feeling free to disagree with that. So like if the general consensus is, oh, Nike did this thing and it's great, but you kind of hate it, like that's okay. Like I think it's really important to also develop your own creative and strategic perspective. Um, so as long as you, as long as you understand why, like dig into those feelings and figure out like, why don't you like that? Like, what do you think is wrong? Um, I think that's really key to moving ahead in this field is Having, having a very distinct point of view and having reasons to back that up. Okay. Um, I know it changes with like different businesses and different industries. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time, um, in some of the third years here, I'm not happy about it, but we spend a lot of time on analytics. And especially in social and digital, we live in analytics. How important was that for you? And I know that depending on the size of the business, they farm out the analytics or farm out the creative, but was that something that you paid close attention to? Yes, absolutely. So we pay, I pay such close attention to analytics. Um, when I was at Wendy's, we did have a person on the agency side dedicated to analytics just because for us, we were obviously, we, um, we were so active. We had a lot of paid advertising going on um, and we did so much reporting for so many different people and departments. We just really needed one person whose full-time job it was to do that stuff. Um, in my current role, I am responsible for analytics, um, which is a little bit different, um, but it's definitely, it helps inform um, what content is resonating, um, when we should be posting. Um, it really, data data informs all of, all of our decisions as it pertains to social media. So I really think if you're, if you're not pulling your analytics, you're missing a very important step. Can, can you share any analytic tools that you use for some of the students and businesses in the audience? Yeah, so right now um, we're still reviewing analytics tools. Um, all of the, right at, so currently I'm at Postmates um, based out of San Francisco. And right now we are in the middle of looking for an analytics vendor. Um, so I do not have an answer for that right now, but I'm looking for one because right now I'm pulling them all natively through the platforms and it's a pain. So. <laughs> Um, well, with your current role, what are you, it sounds like you're responsible for analytics and content. Can you describe what you're doing now and how it spans like all the different areas? Because what we're trying to tell the students and what we teach is social and digital can go in many different directions and it depends on the business and it depends on your role. But can you touch on maybe a typical day, what you're responsible for, what you do? Is that something you can share? Yeah, sure. So my current role is a little, I am currently the social media manager at Postmates. I was previously the social media manager at Wendy's. Um, and even though the job title is exactly the same, um, the responsibilities are different just because the companies are so different. So at Wendy's, I was really responsible. Um, I did a lot of community management just because we, um, we needed some assistance. We had a guy on our agency side who was very heavily responsible for that. But as, um, as things grew, we sort of, we needed more hands. Um, but I was often mostly responsible for providing strategic direction to our creative agency and then working internally on a lot of projects like 
crisis management and working with customer care and things like that. Um, I started at Postmates about a month ago after being freelance for about a year. And um, so we don't have an agency. We create our content in-house. Um, we've got a team of designers. Um, we do have an agency for um, larger creative campaigns, but day to day, it's um, just the internal team. And then, um, yeah, so it's really, it's kind of the same deal except no agency. So everything's in house. It's me doing community management. It's, um, I don't know. I just kind of showed up and they were like, it's, it's a startup. So I sort of showed up and they were like, here you go. Um, so I'm still sort of figuring it out, but it's been really exciting. Um, they're a much younger brand. They've only been around for a couple of years. So there's no, um, they're kind of, they're open to taking communications in a much edgier direction. Um, and they really, they really want to talk a lot about things like, um, they want to be a socially responsible. They want to talk about things like diversity and inclusivity in technology, um, things like that. So it's really, it's, and it's a much smaller company, um, in terms of people in the office. Like I'm two people removed from the CEO, whereas at Wendy's, I never, never saw the guy, which was probably good because I would have been terrified, um, just having to meet the CEO of Wendy's seems terrifying. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely a very different situation. Um, but it's, it's interesting. And I, um, I feel like sort of having that background coming out of Wendy's, having, um, having worked in this very structured corporate environment for almost five years is really sort of, it, uh, it's given me kind of a background for how I think things should work in the future at Postmates. Um, so it's sort of like, I've, I've come in and I've got like a blueprint in my head and now I just have to like make it happen. So pretty cool. Um, the downside is it's, um, I don't know, they're all looking to me. So I guess I, I can't let them down. <laughs> With your success, there were quite a few articles written about you and from one of them, we don't know if it's true or not. Um, the person that hired you said they trolled you online. Is that true? Did they find you based on content you posted and then offered you a job? Or is that? So, um, it's, it's a little bit true. I am. Um, so I applied for the job first and I had my social media profiles on my resume and, uh, Brandon, the guy who hired me, who I mentioned previously, he, um, he went to my Twitter and I remember exactly what I was tweeting about the day he um, he went and looked at my Twitter profile. It was um, I was tweeting about the concept of if there were if there were another layer of hell called super hell, who would be there? And so like definitely definitely not like professional stuff. Just, I was like, I had just gotten, I had been commuting across the city and I was behind like a very slow semi truck and the person behind me was honking. And I was like, people who are behind you and they're honking when there's a slow truck in front of you are going to super hell. And he was like, I love your tweets. I saw you applied for this position. And he told me that everyone else who had applied for the position was like, they had very professional buttoned up Twitter accounts, like, um, like tweet, tweeting links to Mashable talking about like the state of social media, which is fine if like, that's what you're into. But he was looking for, he's like, we're looking for someone to be the voice of Wendy's. And I don't necessarily like, I liked your tweets as an example of what Wendy's could be. And I didn't really see that from anyone else. So that's kind of, and then I went in for the interview and he's like, what do you think about Wendy's social media? And I told him I thought it sucked and <laughs> he hired me and the rest is kind of history. So I don't know if you should necessarily emulate what I did, but it kind of goes back to the idea of you don't need to, you don't need to be anyone else than who you are to, to get the job you're looking for. Like there are, there are a lot of places where that would not have worked for me. Like, and I know that, but there are probably, there are probably jobs I would not have wanted anyway. So, um, I don't know. I think, I think really all you, if you're bringing your whole weird self to the table, it's in, in a way that's like still like, don't, don't go too weird on the, on the timeline. Like there are, there are boundaries, but, um, 
you know, I think it's a lot of it is about just being you and showing some personality. Like brands need that. So I think reflecting that in your personal social media presence goes a long way. Do you have trouble convincing some people of that because they believe that their brand shouldn't explore that on social? It should be buttoned up. It should be professional. And some don't realize that it's that conversation. So are, do you find in industry some are failing to adopt that or even recognize that and don't want to take that chance to go out there because it would backfire? It's almost that risk aversion to this. Or Do you see that well, in industry? I think it's such a it's such a fine line, right? Like, I, I mean, I got to tell you, I always made the lawyers at Wendy's just so super nervous, and they're such nice people, but I get it. And I think it's because <laughs> there is such a fine line between like you can be conversational and still professional, but you know, Wendy's does sort of tread that fine line between like, is this okay? And like, oh my God, I can't believe a company's doing that. And I think it really takes a person who like. I think part of the part of what you're seeing is people people who are worried that just like anyone is going to go out and try to replicate that. So I think part of the issue is you've really got to it it takes work to make it look effortless. So I think you've really got to you've really got to have a strategy in mind. You've really got to understand your brand like we we went over and over and over, like, who is Wendy's? What should they sound like? Like, we could all recite sort of the brand character in our sleep, um, things like that. So I think, um, and also, I don't know. I just, I've, I've got a lot of thoughts. <laughs> With some businesses, and we find in their, um, they don't take the plunge, I guess, with, organic social, right? The conversation, because they can't prove an ROI for it. So they think it's a channel that uh, can come next or come last. What would you say to convince businesses that organic social and conversing with your customers is really important if they can't measure it? They don't see that correlation between I'm going to make money on this channel. How do you convince them that this will make them money or why they should do it? Because some are hesitant because they can't put direct attribution there, right? What would you say yeah. to them? I mean, I would tell them that your customers are already there and they're already talking about you, whether you're participating or not. So the choice is really, do you want to be part of the conversation or do you want this conversation to happen without you? I mean, because that, that's really the choice. The choice, is, the choice isn't, do you, you want to be on social media or not? You already are. It's just, you're not participating in it, but like your brand, your brand is, you just have no control because people are talking about it and you're not listening. So I think it's really sort of reframing it as, I mean, having, taking some of that control back. If you're, if you're on social, you can help guide that conversation. You can take part of it. You can listen to what people are saying. You can use that data to help inform, um, like this weekend we got a Postmates got, um, we had a customer care issue that turned into actually really great product insight that hopefully we're going to, um, I sent along that hopefully someone will at least take into account for the next app update. But like, I think there's so much, it's more than just marketing. It's really like, it is sort of open, like people just type their stream of consciousness thoughts about you into the internet and you can tap into that and yeah that's a little bit scary but it's also really helpful if you know what to do with it do you see any platforms that graduates should pay attention to do you see anything up and coming something new something that people are or basically are underutilized is there anything that anyone in the audience can pay attention to other than like facebook twitter snapchat instagram is there something else that you see um i think I think musically, the one that the the kids are on <laughs> is interesting. I I I don't get it, and I am not on it. But um, I definitely I think it's fascinating that you can start lip syncing to songs and then be like Instagram famous. That's nuts to me. I don't know if it has brand potential, but I think that's like the most fascinating social platform that is currently out there. And I think 
of the existing social platforms. I think Instagram stories is going to be the next one that people really need to figure out if they haven't already. Um, that's the one that I like the most right now. So really trying to dig into that one. Um, and then I'm, I'm so excited to see if Instagram stories and Snapchat, um, like what happens there. Um, so, but beyond that, I'm not sure if there's anything new on the horizon that I'm that excited about. Like I know Vero was a thing for a couple of days before everyone found out it was like funded by some Saudi oil billionaire and also like their website kept crashing. And so I don't know if anyone's even still on that or if they were in the first place. Um, I don't know. There's, I, there's like no, there's not like an underground thing that I'm on though. So, um, I don't know. Sorry. I just have uh, two more quick questions here. Um, we talk a lot in social class about AR and VR. We're seeing mm -hmm. quite a bit with that being implemented into campaigns. Do you notice that happening more in organic campaigns? You see more businesses using virtual reality, augmented reality, and what are your thoughts on it? So I think VR and AR are really interesting, but I do think that the technology I think there's still kind of a gap in consumer adoption. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I think that consumer adoption needs to catch up a little bit. Like, I think consumers are still like, they're interested in VR and it's really cool, but I don't know that like, I think right now it's still sort of like, if, if you're a company and you're somewhere and you have the VR headset, like, that's a cool execution, but I don't think there's enough consumer adoption of VR, like on a personal level in the household, unless you're like, unless you're a tech company that produces VR for that to be, um, for that to be applicable to most of your audience. Um, I think AR is really interesting because that one, obviously it's like that just like AR, like, like we saw the summer of Pokemon go, I guess that was like two summers ago now, like, I think I think AR has a lot more is the one that's a lot more interesting in the immediate future. Um, but I don't know. I, yeah, I'm excited to see what comes of that. But I think I, I think we're still a few years out from those being like really um, widespread. Mainstream. Okay. Um, and my last question um, for students entering like our third years are graduating in a couple months. Uh, many of those are going to go into digital or social. Um, do you have any advice for them? What would you say to them working in the digital industry? Yeah, so I guess I can only draw on my own experience. And my own experience was obviously that I, um, so I said I took an internship after college. I went to college and majored in newspaper journalism because social media was like barely a thing when I was in college. I graduated in 2011. Um, and I was like, I am going to get a job at like Google or Facebook or Twitter. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and I am going to kill it. And then like, I didn't. And I was just so, I was, <laughs> I was so depressed. I was like, I am a huge failure. I applied for like, I had this spreadsheet that my mom still makes reference to. It was like just keeping track of the jobs I had applied to. And I, it was, this was also like coming out of the recession. So it's probably different for you. Like, but I applied to a ton of jobs and I just wasn't getting any of them. And I was like, I'm never going to be successful at anything in my life. And so like, you don't have to get your dream job uh, right out of college. Like, that might not happen for you and that is okay. Like you can, you can work up to that and it's not the end of the world. Like I wish someone, I wish I had a time machine to go back and tell my 22 year old self that like, you probably don't want to work at Google anyway. Like you might not just like knowing what I know now, I might just not be put out for that environment anyway. But like, I don't know. I think, I think there's so much pressure to like, achieve something young it feels like there's so much there's like a time limit on achievement and i i just i don't know be gentle with yourself i think i am um, you know it's there's you can i don't know i i think that's the advice i wish i had at college graduation is that like you know you you don't have to like 
if you come out of college graduation hoping you're going to make like a huge cannonball splash and it's more of like a blip, like that's okay. Like there's still time. You have the whole life to do stuff. So, um, yeah, that's the advice I wish I had. Thanks. Um, if you've got a couple of minutes, I don't know if there's any questions in the audience, but if you've got a few minutes to spare and there are questions, would you mind? Would you have a couple of minutes if people have questions? Yeah, absolutely. I um, I have to get out of here at 12, but yeah, I've got a couple minutes right now. Does anybody have any? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just a, just a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Hi there. My name is Ryan Percy, and I'm a journalism student at St. Clair College. Um, hey. As someone that saw the fan base of Wendy's grow around this snarky personality, um, what are some of the weirder, like, fan creations that you saw spring up from the community? Oh my gosh. Um, so I've got to say the weirdest one was obviously, um, and if you were watching, you probably saw this, but it was the, um, the anime community online turned the Wendy's, the Wendy's logo into smug Wendy, like a, a waifu. I think I am saying that right. Um, <laughs> I am, I, I'm still like, but she's like, she's like a sexy anime cartoon of the Wendy's logo. Some of it was safe for work, but a lot of it was not. And, um, so that was, that was very strange. Um, I don't know if they're still doing that. I, I hope to God they've stopped cause that was very weird. Um, <laughs> that was, but yeah, I think that was probably the weirdest. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Hi. I was just wondering, have you ever met any of the people behind the McDonald's and Burger King social media accounts? I have. So um, a couple of, I went to a conference and I saw, he's not at Burger King anymore, but I saw the guy, I met, saw the guy who used to be at Burger King while he was still at Burger King. And he gave a presentation about, um, it was about how they, came up with the idea to relaunch chicken fries and it was all about like they used social I don't know he was so smart he like came up with this idea um using their social data and how people were like demanding they bring back chicken fries um and yeah so I met him and we had a chat and he's so nice we're still in touch I think he works at Carl's Jr. now um and then yeah I've had some interactions online with the McDonald's social media team. I don't know any of them personally. Um, but yeah, so we have had the chance to interact. They're all very nice people. Um, so no hard feelings. <laughs> um, I do occasionally feel bad about the social media banter, but they all seem to take it in stride. Uh, one more question. How much Wendy's do you eat? Oh my God. <laughs> um, I, so I do eat a lot of Wendy's. Um, my husband also, I met my husband at Wendy's. He worked in the IT department. Um, so often when we are, um, we just need a quick dinner. It's sort of our default. So yeah, I um, I don't want to think about how many double stacks I've eaten, but it's a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, hi, Amy. Um, hi. I'm, so I'm just wondering for personal as well as for the Wendy's account, I'm sure there's a million ways to do it, but what did you find as being like the top three most helpful ways to grow your social media following? When, so either in like a personal way or through, through the accounts that you've worked on at Wendy's. Um, so honestly, when it comes to, so we... So we never really focused on account growth as like a primary metric. Um, personally for me, it's never really been a, th a primary metric because I've always sort of been, um, I don't, I don't want anyone to follow me. They just do. <laughs> I feel my tweets are so dumb. Um, on Wendy's it's, it, it was always sort of a secondary metric and we kind of based it on if we're doing things right, people will follow us. So we were always focused more on, um, we we're always fo focused more on campaign metrics, on 
So things like, do people know that that we have this new sandwich? Are they talking about it? Or like, do people like this content? Is it resonating? And so audience growth was honestly, it was something we checked in on, but it was never something we focused on. And so I know that's sort of an unsatisfying answer, but it's really kind of how we always just sort of like, well, we really want to focus on putting out this quality content. And if the content is truly quality, then people will want to follow us to see it. So it's almost like a secondary aspect then, how it kind of just, if try- I'm so sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I said, yeah, so that, so it's kind of like a secondary aspect then, like if you, if, if it spreads, you know you've done it right, I guess. It's yeah. Just, okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, now you said uh, you had, it sounds like a lot of your friends that you're meeting uh, are moving to different places. How do you just handle what seems like an industry of people changing jobs a lot? Uh, Could like, you repeat that? Uh, like you said, you had a friend that works with, started at Wendy's, now Carl's Jr. or Papa John's. Like it sounds like a lot of people are moving to different companies and you're now at Postmates. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you handle an industry where there's a lot of movement yeah, so I definitely, you know, I think it's, you've always just got to, you'll know when it's time. I think it's kind of one of those things that it used to be that you got one job and you stayed in it for like, it used to be sustainable to get a job and have that job for your entire career um, and retire. And that was it. And that's just not really the case anymore. Um, that's just like you're you're more than likely gonna like but millennials like we're gonna our attention span's gonna go somewhere else or someone's gonna someone's gonna try to lure us away or like worst case scenario you're gonna you might get laid off um that i don't know if that um i don't know if that is typical in canada but that happens a lot in the united states so um i think it's one of those things where you really just You've got to have in, in the back of your mind, you've got to understand that that's always a possibility that like this job is for now, it's not forever. Um, so sort of valuing, valuing it for what you can have, valuing it for what it is while it is, and but always being ready for whatever the next step might be, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Flood. I'm a journalism student like uh, you were. Uh, I'm curious, what skills from journalism did you gain that aided you the most in becoming a successful social media manager? Yeah, um, so I think more than anything, and this sort of goes back to what I said earlier, but honestly, I think the one work experience that helped me in this job more than anything else, and people always get really confused when I say this, but it was working for four years as a cashier. Um, and it's cause I think really more than anything, what's gonna help you being a social media manager is developing empathy and being able to interact with like literally any weirdo because that's most of the job is like, especially community management is people, people are gonna come at you with all kinds of things. Like it's true in the real world, but it's even truer on the internet where people can like, they're behind an avatar, they feel like they can say whatever they want, especially to a company because they don't feel like you're a human being. Um, so I think really being able to like, step outside yourself and into someone else's shoes and be like, okay, they seem angry or irrational, but let's like, let's try to walk this back. Let's try to put ourselves in their shoes and like, okay, yeah, it does suck that like you've had a long day and your food is cold and you got all the way home and you found out it's wrong. Like maybe I wouldn't scream at someone on the internet for it, but like, let's figure out how to handle this. I think it's really important to be able to, to empathize with, with people, even when they're being like unrealistic or nuts. Um, I also think one of the, one of the skills that a lot of people tend to overlook in a career like this is creative writing. Um, I took some creative writing courses in college that I think really um, 
are still really valuable to me today. And also, um, like basic photography skills and knowing, knowing your way around like the Adobe creative suite, that's really important. Um, just they'll like, they'll help you, um, just know how to make a GIF. Like that's, that's important. So. As a Taco Bell uh, worker, I see where you're coming from with the whole uh, fast food dealing with people type thing. And uh, just a little side note, I gotta ask, could you please explain what is behind your Twitter bio? Can you say that again? Can you please explain like what's behind your Twitter bio? I'm so curious. My Twitter bio. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at it right now. Oh, um, so my Twitter bio. Um, I am so sorry if you don't want me to swear, but I'm going to read it out loud. Um, just so everyone in the room has context is please stop shitting here. This is my office. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's the story behind that? I'm, I'm really curious. So the here would be Twitter because Twitter's my office. Um, and I guess the, the shitting would be just like, you know, being, being weird and bad and like. <laughs> okay, uh, that makes sense. Thank you. I don't know. That's, it's just a dumb thing I wrote. That's the story. Oh, it's, it's Scott. It's actually fantastic. Um, <laughs> it's not like from anything. It's just no. from my brain. Okay. We just have a couple more quick questions for you, if that's okay. Hi, Amy. How are you? Hi. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Rebecca. I teach in the PR program. And I just wanted to ask you, I mean, obviously, Wendy's has been super successful with their kind of sarcastic and dry approach. Um, how transferable are these tactics to building other brands? And how can our students learn from Wendy's and their social media and their future careers? Yeah, so I think... Like, obviously, these tactics, we decided they worked for Wendy's because we sort of decided that coming out of, like, determining who is Wendy's, what would the personality of Wendy's be, we determined that Wendy's as, like, a challenger brand would be these things. Um, but obviously, that wouldn't necessarily work for every brand. So I think that it's definitely, it's not something that you would just, it's not, it's not much that you would just lift and apply to like any other brand. And it's, it's definitely not a one size fits all approach. Um, that said, I think, I think what, what you should take from this is the idea that you can, you can look inwardly at the brand you're working for and sort of, you can develop interesting and personable you can personify a brand in a way that maybe maybe wouldn't be immediately obvious so i think that like you look at wendy's like and what what wendy's is doing like they're selling cheeseburgers and fries and i guess it doesn't seem immediately obvious that wendy's would be like sarcastic and kind of like an instigator but i think it there is there is reasoning for that. I think you can make a solid case for that. So I think it's, I think really what you could take from it is this idea of digging, digging deep into your brand and sort of what the characteristics are of your brand to build, build kind of this creative, <clears throat> excuse me, this creative, kind of just, I don't want to say think outside the box because it's like the worst thing, but, um, <laughs> You can really you can really approach it from so many different directions. Like that's def like that's not the only way we could have approached Wendy's from, but um, it's it's the one that worked. So I think there are so many different angles you can approach brand messaging from, and I think this is really a lesson in how to creatively approach something that's maybe not super interesting. Like I don't, I love these, but I don't like how do you really differentiate one fast food restaurant from another fast food restaurant that's essentially doing the same thing. So I think it's kind of a lesson in 
creative differentiation, if that makes sense. Right, right. So from a PR perspective, it's about perception and I guess determining your brand's personality and seeing the value in these organic interactions uh, via yeah. social media. Yeah, great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. You said it better than me. <laughs> Well, it seems that's all the questions, Amy. Thank you so much for today. I uh, apologize for the, some of the technical difficulties at the beginning, but I'm glad we can connect and do it. I thought that it was fantastic. Thank you for having oh, me. Oh. This was fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>